Good afternoon. Welcome to Democracy and the Court. Uh, this, I'm Tom Wilson. I'm the CEO of Allstate. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Aspen Institute and the Atlantic Monthly for uh, sponsoring this today. Uh, we have a, a great program this afternoon, so uh, bear with it. I know it's late in the afternoon, but if you get your energy up, keep focused, uh, it'll be worth your while. Uh, we have two great people here with us today. Uh, Jeff Rosen, uh, who's a professor of law at George Washington University, uh, is written extensively on uh, legal affairs. He's actually written a book about the Supreme Court. Uh, and of course, we know the Supreme Court is uh, quite a unique institution in our land. Uh, it in many ways has the final say. Uh, we leave it with the responsibility to interpret our founding principles uh, and our justices are appointed for life. And when you have such a unique institution, it requires a unique leadership. Uh, somebody who cares more about themselves uh, than they do, or more about us than they do themselves. <laughs> Sorry, that, that, that may be my speech on sort of some of our newer people. Um, uh, but um, somebody who, who really wants to listen uh, and uh, thinks broadly, and Justice Breyer is currently, um, you know, one of our uh, fabulous justices and been on the court for over 13 years. So if we could thank him for everything you've done for us so far, uh, and what he will do for us today. Please, uh, with no further ado, Jeff Rosen, Silk Road Star. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always a unique opportunity to have in a conversation with Justice Breyer about democracy in the courts, but this is an especially exciting time for our conversation today. Since he joined the court, Justice Breyer has been the most eloquent defender of a vision of pragmatism and liberal judicial restraint. He calls this active liberty, and he says that by paying attention to the democratic purposes of the Constitution, judges can promote democratic deliberation, and by paying attention to the consequences of their decision, they can better serve society. Now, as you all know, just a few weeks ago, in uh, the Seattle schools case, Justice Breyer delivered one of the most inspiring, incisive, passionate, and convincing dissents that he's ever written. And if you want to applaud him for that, I think it's well deserved. If, and I don't care whether you're lawyers or not, all of you have no excuse, go look it up on the internet. SupremeCourtUS.gov, it's only 77 pages. <laughs> but believe it or not, it is riveting reading. You'll find that you can't put it down because it is so uh, convincing, logical, and uh, uh, strong in its defense of judicial restraint. Uh, Justice Breyer, obviously we have to start with this case. I know you talked about it uh, earlier this week, but not all of us were there. You're now among a small group of friends uh, on public radio and YouTube, uh, <laughs> so you can speak candidly without any fear of uh, us betraying your confidences. What was it about this decision in particular that set you on fire and got you so worked up? Is it on? Yes. All right, good. Thank you for that introduction, by the way. Now I'm going to have to answer all your questions very thoroughly after such a nice introduction. But I think, can I go back for a step? Please. Because I, I think you, you, you'd, you'd have to see, uh, which is what you were talking about in general, you'd have to see how at least I'm thinking of this document, the Constitution of the United States, uh, which I've had the privilege of interpreting or helping to interpret over the past 13 years. It has a few words in it, seven articles, I think 27 amendments. And after a period of time on the court, I think any judge with the steady diet of constitutional cases that we have begins to see the document as a whole. Now, I can describe in general terms, not three words, not one word, but probably in under a minute, how I think most of us see that document. Sandra O'Connor, Tony Kennedy, and I were at Mrs. Annenberg, who was doing a marvelous thing trying to get civics taught in the high schools. Couldn't be better. And we were looking at a number of uh, surveys that they took of lawyers. What is the Constitution about? What should we teach first? And some said, the First Amendment. Some said equal protection. Some said privacy or religion. But we all used a word that was way down on the list. And that word was democracy. 
Now, anyone who's a judge will look at the document and say the heart of the document is the first seven articles, and those articles create democratic political institutions. So if you have to say in a word what the Constitution is about, you say it's about democracy. And what that means is it isn't the Constitution that decides how people should live together. It is up to individuals through the democratic process to decide what kinds of cities, states, towns, and nation they want. And if they make bad decisions, that's up to them. And we hope they'll make good ones, but they're not our decisions to make. It isn't the document. Now, having said the word democracy, you have to add a few words. You say, well, it's a certain kind of democracy. It's a democracy that is uh, protective of basic human liberty. That's the amendments. It assures a degree of equality. That's the 14th Amendment. It divides power horizontally, three branches of government, executive, legislative, judicial, and vertically, state, federal, so that no single group of people in government can become too powerful. And it insists upon a rule of law. All right, you see, there we have it. Democracy, uh, fundamental rights, uh, Division of powers, um, equal protection, rule of law. And I think all nine of us would at that level begin to agree, for at least we'd be in agreement for three or four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I spell that out because once you see that, you can see the basic job of being a judge on our court. I see that basic job as well, the document leaves virtually, virtually, but not all, decisions up to you. And what we're doing is patrolling the boundaries. That is, it creates a big space for democracy to work, but there are boundaries. And who are we? We are the boundary patrol. We work at the frontier. Now, life at the frontier is sometimes a little tough because it's sometimes filled with very difficult cases. Are they inside that boundary or outside the boundary? Now, that's the introduction. Now I can answer your question. <laughs> because in the school's case, what we were asked to do, as I see it, is we're asked to decide whether a certain kind of activity in the school districts in Seattle and Louisville, what kind? They were trying to achieve a degree of integration in the schools. And in particular, they were trying to get inner city kids spread around a little bit so that all those schools would be good enough where you didn't have isolation in the community. Now, to do that, what they did was they had, one, they didn't want forced busing. That was very unpopular, and it led to white flight. So what they did was they said, no more busing. Uh, we will. In fact, give every high school student that was Seattle, or all students in a certain complicated way, a choice. They can go to whatever school they want, but if the school that they choose has too many minority children or too few minority children, what's too many or too few? Well, in Seattle, if a school was more than 85% white, you could have up to 85%, but we want to assure a minority population in every school of at least 15%. Now, if your choice or your child's choice put it over that 85%, the child couldn't go to that school. He'd, in Seattle, have to go to a different high school for a year, and then he could transfer and get a choice that he might prefer. All right, now that's what's in front of us. And the question is, note, it's race conscious, that condition that I just mentioned. It's race conscious. And so the question is, does that race consciousness, that race reference, does it or does it not go beyond the boundary? Well, what's the boundary here? The boundary here is set by the Equal Protection Clause, and the Equal Protection Clause says no state shall deprive any person of equal protection of the law. All right, now you have the general approach. Now you have the question. Now you still haven't got your answer, <laughs> which is why was I so exercised? The short answer is, of course, I thought if there ever is a case 
I overstate that only by a millimeter. <laughs> if there ever is a case that the Constitution wanted to be left to local school boards, states, local governments, maybe even national governments, but not judges, that's the example. So wh why not? Why would the court find this so difficult? It found it so difficult and probably reasonably so difficult. It's not as easy as you might think. And the reason it's not as easy as you might think is the following. Remember those words I just told you, equal protection of the law. Well, there are two views of what that means. One view of what that means is called, shorthand, the colorblind view. And on the colorblind view, if you say race, it's out. We don't care if you're helping minorities, hurting minorities, helping white people, hurting white people, herping, helping, whatever. Race out, color blind, goodbye, that's the end of it. And there's more to be said for that point of view than I'm normally prepared to admit. But there is quite a lot to be said for it. But there is a second point of view, and it is the point of view that, I, of course, I favor, and I believe it's the point of view that's been embodied in the law for a long time. And call that the purposive point of view. And the purposive interpretation says, let's go back and look at why this clause was written. What clause? The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Who wrote it? Well, the Congress that had won the Civil War. And why did they write it? They wrote it because they saw people who had been slaves and had been kept down in a caste. We know that story, and it's a terrible story. And they wanted those people to be brought into American society. And they wanted minorities to be brought into American society. And what their problem was, with race differences, laws that had race differences, laws that discriminated in manners that excluded in a way that excluded people. And so what the purposive view says is there is a difference, a difference in the Constitution between a discriminatory practice or law that excludes people and one that includes people. All right, now I've really given you a whole law class. And I, of course, favor that difference. I say, of course, there's a difference. So I say, Mr. Madison, you know, who's here in my mind, Mr. Madison, when you wrote this, of course, it's totally anachronistic. He didn't even write the 14th Amendment. So I say, well, Mr. Madison, when you wrote the Constitution, what was your idea? Would you think that, uh, what was your point here? And I think he would say, since he can't help himself, since I put words in his mouth, he said, we want a document that will work in a democratic way for 200 or 300 or 400 or 500 or 1,000 years. And to get that to work in a democratic way, you cannot have systems, in my, well, not more than my opinion. I think it's the Constitution's opinion. You cannot have societies that exclude people on the basis of race. So therefore, what? Therefore, when you have a law that includes people, that helps the democratic process to work. And as soon as I think of that, I think, of course, there's a difference. And why do I think this is the case? And now this is your answer. One, I think that colorblind view is very wrong. Two, I think it's never been in the law. I think it's never been accepted before by a majority of this court. Three, if my goodness, if there was ever a decision that should be made locally, it is this one. And why do I think that? Because I look at a few facts and figures, and one of them says that one black child out of every six is now in a school where the population of the school is 99 to 100% black. Because I can read as well as you, and we look around and say there are problems of race and poverty in the inner cities of America. And so to disable the democratic process from dealing as best it sees fit with those problems, of course, I got slightly exercised. And the way that I take out my, uh, I guess, the way I show this, is I write 77-page uh, opinions, and uh, people are then put to the trouble, a few of them, of, of uh, having to read it. Excellent. Well, I, bravo.
I hope you continue to get exercise because it makes for very good reading. Uh, but I want to ask you more about precedence. You said that in this case, it was your view that the majority was overruling precedence without saying so explicitly. And it seemed that in several cases this year, that same pattern recurred. The majority insisted that it was respecting previous precedents, and you felt that they were just being less than candid. Uh, is it better for the court to overrule precedents openly, and does the current majority uh, disrespect precedents in this way? I'll answer the first part of the question. The first part of the question is, in my opinion, it is better to be open. Uh, and of course, you know, when I, when, when, I'll give you a couple of numbers. Uh, there were 10 cases listed as important cases in the newspaper, if you can't take that as a base. And uh, I was in the majority twice, that was better than nothing. <laughs> and uh, in the other cases, uh, in three of the cases, the majority said it was overruling prior precedent. And in, set, in four other cases, the minority or other judges on the court said, you are overruling prior precedent. So remember, there's disagreement about this. I thought that there was quite a lot of precedent overruled. But the people on the other side who were very good judges, they thought that there wa they weren't overruling the case. And here you only have a chance to hear one side of it, and, and it really my judicial instinct knows that that's unfair. But still I have my view. <laughs> so, I think it's better to be open. It's not the case, never overrule a precedent. That isn't true, it's not right. Think of Brown versus Board of Education. Brown versus Board of Education is a case in which Plessy versus Ferguson, which had been the law, for 80 years and created a caste system in America was overruled. Do I think that was bad? No, I think it was great. I think you do have to be careful about overruling precedent because people plan their lives on the basis of law. And if law is too unstable, they won't know how to plan their personal lives, their business lives, their, their, they won't know how to live. And, and that is a very undesirable thing. So if you want a basic rule, the basic rule is you can overrule precedent if you are on a court, like mine, but please be very careful about it. And I think, and explain what you're doing. And focus on the issue why, and say why. Now, of course, I had a, what I guess a, a slight uh, well, and I'll say what I said, and I won't characterize it. In the school's case, I did, I do admit to having asked the question, because I discussed a lot of cases, and I did say, uh, well, what happened to Gruder? That was the affirmative action case in the Michigan schools. Uh, what happened to Swan? What happened to McDaniels? What happened to Crawford? What happened to the Seattle School District Number 1? What happened to the uh, uh, Boston School Committee? And I was listing a bunch of cases. And in my view, I said, well, these cases have been uh, vibrant and alive, and now they've been uh, erased from the law. And so I thought uh, that they were not uh, uh, paying adequate attention to the precedent there, the majority. But the other side thought they were. So if you're going to read mine, you better read theirs. Now, it wasn't only precedent that the court majority said it cared about. Uh, in a series of interviews last year, the new Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, said that he cared a lot about unanimous narrow decisions that would allow people from both sides to converge on a common outcome. Uh, he said this to lots of people, including in an interview with me, of all people, uh, in The Atlantic, which he gave last July. Now, some people thought I was too charmed by Chief Justice Roberts in this interview. He's very charming. And in fact, my wife said that I have a man crush on Chief Justice Roberts <laughs> based on this interview. So naturally, I was very distressed to look at the statistics of this term and see that far from having a lot of narrow unanimous opinions, there were more five to four decisions than at any time in recent history. Why did Chief Justice Roberts fail in his much vaunted effort to achieve narrow unanimous opinions? And might he succeed in the future? I would say that's a question best asked him. I'd say, I've learned from interviews, beware of charming interviewers. <laughs> <laughs> I can say, well, I mean, I know this did some statistics, that you're right about, you're right about there being more 5-4. Uh, I, I was interested because the last full term that Sandra O'Connor was there uh, was 2004 term, 2004-2005. 
and comparing that to this term. Uh, the number of... Oh, oh sorry. I, I, yes, good point. <laughs> uh, I, uh, the uh, uh, 2004 term, if we compare it to this term, that was her, Sandra O'Connor's last full term, and this is really our first full year, you know, with the things have sort of got with our new members. Um, the number of unanimous opinions, and I, I tend to know this, I exaggerate a little sometimes when I talk to audiences, and, and I talk to school kids, I, I, which I love doing. I, I say, uh, uh, you know, our, our, and I talk to audiences about the court, and I'll, I'll say, well, about 30 to 40 percent of our cases are unanimous, and you don't know that because the reporters find those boring. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I have to say this year the number was about 30 2% or so in 2004. This year, I think it fell about 10 points to about 22. And I say then, and you know, take the cases that aren't unanimous, really the five fours are about 20 to 25%, typical number. All right, this year they went up to 33%. And then if you look, and I then add, and uh, um, it's not always the same five and the same four which I'm glad to see that outcome. You know, I don't decide a case on the ground, am, is it going to be the same five or the same four, or anything like that. It's the job of other people to characterize the overall results. I work on a case on the basis of what do I think is the right answer here. And that's often difficult because, of course, there are two, two or three or four different answers. But still, if I look back to the five fours, and if, which I hate to do, you were to say, well, I know what you mean by the usual suspects, and that's sometimes for good or sometimes for bad. You're going to say me and John Stevens and Ruth Ginsburg and David Souter. So I look to see how often were we on the same side of a 5-4 case in 2004. And the answer was just over uh, half, around 55%. So it wasn't the same five and the same four. No. This year, 80%. Now, you can say, well, uh, uh, remember that this year may be somewhat atypical, though there are always important decisions and always uh, decisions that have some kind of social or political resonance. That happens quite a lot. But this year we had a case involving abortion. We had a case involving uh, uh, race, the use of race in schools. Uh, we had a case involving campaign finance. And so those are three, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, unusually uh, contentious issues. Yes, but you've had those cases before, all of those cases, and when Justice O'Connor was on the court, there was not the same polarization. So what would you make of the hypothesis that Chief Justice Roberts, whatever his good intentions, had the effect not of bringing you together, but polarizing you? This was the year where you wrote your most passionate dissent. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, who uh, is so wonderful, wrote this spectacular dissent in the partial birth case. She was uncharacteristically passionate. Justice Stevens was passionate. Uh, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that something uh, Chief Justice Roberts is doing is getting your guys back up. And, and what a horrible thing it is to have to go to an event where you have a judge speaking. <laughs> it's terrible. We're trying to interview one. Because I, my answer is, of course, I'm not in the characterization business. I am in the deciding business. And those are quite different things. So it's up to other people to characterize what we do. But this is, you know that this is not oh, a trivial see. series of <laughs> questions. Uh, I didn't say it was trivial. I just said it wasn't my business to answer. It's not your business, but it's something you care a lot about. Because in your book, Active Liberty, you say that it's important for the legitimacy of the court to act in a way that the public can perceive as being legitimate. So you're not the kind of person who uh, typically flies off the handle and writes ill-conceived uh, dissents. What I want to know is, might there be a possibility that uh, Chief Justice Roberts will do better uh, in the future? And if so, what would that take? <laughs> I've got a lot riding on this prediction. <laughs> will he do better in the future? Yes, might he achieve unanimity? He could join my dissents. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the serious answer, the serious answer is, is, is the following. That, that, that it, it, this is a job that people who are appointed have for a long time. And when I first came to the court, uh, the first question in anyone's mind uh, is, well, uh, this is quite a significant uh, position. And it makes a difference to people, a major difference. So how can I do this? Let's be uh, careful. Uh, and it takes a while. It just takes a while. 
I don't care who is appointed, no matter who it is, it takes a while before you have enough experience, cases in front of you, that you begin to understand or at least have a, a, a view of what this document is and a view of the institution. It is extraordinary to me still, as I sit there, that one, two things. One is the complexity of an institution with only nine people. It is very complicated, historically and at any point in time. And the other is, as you look out, and I've said this 50,000 times, so I'll say it a 50,000 and first, perhaps the most extraordinary thing is you look out at that courtroom and you see people of every race, every religion, every point of view imaginable, and there are 300 million people in America and 900 million points of view and several others that aren't imaginable. But, but they, they are there in this courtroom, in this diverse society of 300 million people, and they're being held together because of their belief in law. That's an incredible thing in the course of history, that they've decided to decide their differences, not on the streets, but in courtrooms. And there they are. Now that works on a person. And you see that day after day. And you begin, you, it never loses its, 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 its extraordinary quality, never. And, and I think all those things, over time, work on any person who is appointed to our court. And that's why it's very hard to predict about any person how he will decide things five or, or ten years uh, into the future uh, after uh, experience and the nature of the court and the institution uh, begins to uh, have an impact. It's a different job, different job being a lawyer or a law professor than a judge. I mean, it's, it's not trying to figure out what is the most brilliant thing. It is trying to figure out, and I think this is a word they use of judges, not whether the decision is brilliant, is it sound? And by sound they mean is it the kind of decision that people can live with and the, in, in my view of course, that those who created the Constitution, those who created the statutes, they had some problems in mind, they wanted people to live satisfactorily under their legislative results. And a sound result is one that carries out those basic purposes. Uh, last rude question. Is, is there bad blood because of these disagreements? <laughs> I, I've sat in that conference room for a long time, and people are very professional. They are very professional. They don't raise their voices. They simply go through the, uh, uh, the, the case, and they discuss the matter. What good would it do to, be to raise your voice? Uh, in that conference room. Suppose I said, oh, I feel very strongly. Well, somebody who disagreed with me would say, so do I. And I'd say, but don't you see it's so important? Say, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and don't you see that, that I have the right approach here? It's a, oh, there I disagree. You see, that, that's, uh, the, but so we go around the table, uh, we discuss these things, and the virtue of it being in writing is, of course, before my long, lengthy descent became public, it was seen by other people in many versions. So in a sense, a dissenting opinion is a failure because I'm not really writing, not initially. I'm not really writing for the public. My object in writing these things is first and foremost to try to show my colleagues that at least modify what you do. Maybe even you'll see that I have a few good points. And these go through many drafts, and they go back and forth, and people do respond, and there are responses and responses. And then, if you still, at the end of the day, think that the majority is wrong, fine, then I'll modify it again a few times, uh, and then eventually uh, it will uh, see the light of day. But, but that, that's, the, uh, that's the process. How often have you changed the other side's mind because of a dissent? Well, I'll tell you, I, I got the question, actually it was during Bush versus Gore, uh, which was a very stressful case, uh, and I was in the dissenting side. All right, so I had a question on that a few years later, and uh, it's directly your question. A student, I think, in Virginia somewhere said, well, uh, are you disappointed when you're in dissent? And he meant in that case. And I said, yes, 
Of course I'm disappointed. And it was something a man I clerked for, I admired very much, was Arthur Goldberg, and I was his law clerk. And it was an event honoring him. And I knew what he would say if he were alive. And it's this because it's so true. Fine, I wrote my dissent. I wanted to convince other people, and I didn't. So, I'm disappointed. So, write another dissent the next time. And it's true. I do go home, and I do say to Joanna, now I've written something this time that is really going to convince them. <laughs> and she says, I've heard that before. <laughs> All right, then maybe it won't. So try the next time. And, and one of the great things about the court, and it's good, because as you remind me of the court, you lift my spirits. One of the great things is tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow is another day. I mean, fine. People didn't agree in that case, then they didn't. But we'll have other cases, and more and more and more. And if they don't agree the next time, maybe it'll be the time after that. And, and the great interest and, and uh, uh, emotional satisfaction, in a sense, is the job. You put the thing behind you. You go on to the next one. And, and uh, you'll see, you'll see. I will write a dissent, and it will convince people, and you will never know it was a dissent. I'm delighted to hear you say that thinking about the court lifts your spirits. Do you find yourself optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the court? <laughs> it all depends. <laughs> Don't, you know, you, you can see these things. I'm, 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 of course, not happy that there were so many divided opinions. Of course, I'm not happy uh, that it was uh, uh, the, the lineup all the time that I said. And of course, I'm not happy that I was so often on the dissenting side. Uh, the, the, uh, um, statistic I didn't tell you, and I, I admit <laughs> to having looked it up. Uh, in the 2004 October term, I was in the majority over 80% of the time. And I looked at this term, that's in all the cases, you know, a lot of, and, and uh, then I looked at this term, it's dropped to about, it's dropped 35 points. And uh, so I was in the dissent quite a lot. But, but it is a strong institution, and, and that's what people sometimes miss. These institutions, I mean, you know, it's, it's 200 years and the Civil War and all these uh, terrible problems of segregation and so forth, and throughout our, our institutions have, have survived. So I'm, I'm always optimistic. I'm always optimistic. Well, you're an optimist by nature because your ju judicial philosophy is premised on, on an idea that people left to their own devices can resolve important social problems. And that's why I want to return to this theme of judicial restraint. Uh, is it now the case that the liberals are the party of judicial restraint and the conservatives are not? I looked up some, some statistics too, and I found that in the, for the past couple years, you were tied, uh, uh, you were uh, nearly the justice least likely to strike down state and federal laws. Only Justice Ginsburg was more restrained by that measure. Uh, by contrast, the most activist judge by that measure, the one most likely to strike down state and federal laws, was Justice Kennedy, followed by uh, uh, Scalia and Thomas. So is it now the case we're talking about race and campaign finance and a whole series of cases? You are arguing for deference to democratic outcomes, and it's the conservatives who are arguing for second-guessing them. Are, are liberals now the party of judicial restraint? <laughs> That's your characterization. <laughs> I, I mean, odd, it's so odd in a way, but I mean, it, because you're, it's difficult for people who haven't been in this judicial business to see it. When you start saying liberal and conservative, I, I have a, a kind of, uh, I have a negative reaction. Because, because, I, because I, you really do train yourself. I, I was saying this the other day in respect, people were talking about asking, well, what is, what do the judges think of something or other? I remembered, remember the Rodney King case? And, uh, and the policemen were acquitted, and, and everybody had an opinion about that, everybody. So I went into lunch, I was on the First Circuit Court of Appeals then, and with my colleagues, and I said, what do you think of that? And I got no answer. And I said, well, what, you know, surely you have a view. And, and then, I think it was Lee Campbell, said, said well, I wasn't there, I didn't see the evidence, I wasn't in the jury box, I wasn't the judge. I said, there is a judicial training. 
You see, you get that training. You, you, you actually begin really to think, I have enough things I have to have an opinion about. Why should I have an opinion about something I don't have an opinion about? You see, so so you, you do, and, and then you think of it in terms of these cases are coming up. I will do my best with the case. And then somebody says it's liberal or conservative. All right, that's their right to say that. That's fine. But I'm not in the characterization business. All right, well, I'll put the question in a more high-minded way. <laughs> yeah. You are part of a tradition on the court that has both liberal and conservative advocates, and you know this as well as I do. Uh, it began with Justice uh, Holmes, who is no political liberal, and uh, Judge Hand, who uh, was, was not a conventional liberal either. It was carried on by people like Frankfurter and Brandeis. In the modern era, we saw people like Justice White embodying this tradition, so there's nothing partisan about it, but you are now the most prominent uh, defender of this vision. Do you feel that you are the new acolyte of judicial restraint? If I acolyte, you'd be sort of like a teacher. What is an acolyte? An acolyte. <laughs> I guess, no, I'm the acolyte. You're the visionary. You're, 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 you're the guru. <laughs> you know, you're, you're sort of embodying it. You're well, defending, I mean, you're you defending say, it more prominently you, that, than other That's people. what I tried to put in the, in the, in the thing that I wrote. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in, in, it is true that I, that I think in, in, uh, to a very large measure, judges have to be careful about intruding uh, into the uh, legislative uh, process. Uh, most decisions, vast, vast numbers, are left by the Constitution uh, to that process, to people, ordinary people deciding and through their elected representatives. And, and that's why I like, in fact, too, to give this same talk to high school students, because I want to tell them, which is, uh, I want to tell them, uh, I can't tell you to participate, but I can tell you the Constitution expects you to participate. I can't tell you, you know, that you'll have a better life if part of that life is devoted to the community in a thousand different ways, whether it's the school board or political life or anything else. I can't tell you to do that, but I can tell you that the document that I interpret expects that that will happen. And that's what reminded me of the business quotation, you say, because we really sort of a shocking quotation, hard for people to, to accept, but I use this. You say, I use it. It's Pericles, and Pericles at the funeral oration. And I said that, uh, what did he say in that famous funeral oration that's relevant right now? He said, what do we say in Athens, in ancient democratic Athens, what do we say about a man who does not participate in public life? We do not say, this is a man who minds his own business. We say, this is a man who has no business here. Yeah, tough. And uh, I said, but thou, the framers read that document. They knew that. They had read about ancient Rome, and they knew about Athenian democracy. And they had limited democracy. They didn't have the women. They didn't have the slaves. They didn't have the minorities, etc. But among the people that they were prepared at that time to admit as citizens, that democracy was first and foremost. Now, over time, we've seen the court waver from that. And indeed, the 19th century court and the early 20th century court reacted in a way that probably didn't respect that vision. And when Roosevelt was appointed, uh, the court began to change. And the whole point of judicial restraint was just that, leave to the legislature, leave to the legislature the decision making. But then, and that's why Frankfurter and others had such a problem, they didn't see in the early New Deal court because they weren't quite faced with the problem of civil liberties. And they were, had some, and some saw it, but many didn't. And then with Warren, when the Warren court came in, this is just my view, I mean, you better get a really good historian if you want to know, but my view of, of, of it is that the Warren court suddenly said, because the country understood that, we are going to make this phrase in the Constitution equal protection of law mean what it says. Because we look across the country, equal protection, what are you talking about? All you have to do is look to the South, and there's no equal protection at all. But it says equal protection of the law, so let's do it. So you say that's a literal court. That's a court that uh, uh, is not respecting wrong, because I, that's why I started out the way I started out. I started out saying there is a constitution that at the heart of it leaves to the democratic process lots, but not everything. 
because we understand be better than anybody after the 20th century that democracies can tyrannize too. And that's why I started out by saying, yes, it's a democratic process, but a democratic process with limits. Limits that respect fundamental liberty, uh, limits that make certain that the power is divided, limits that make certain that uh, uh, equal protection of the law, and uh, rule of law. All right, now, you see it's complicated vision, but not too complicated. And I think that is what, in my mind, if I want to imagine what people who aren't here would have said, that if Learned Hand had been brought up to a period past the war in court, he would have come to some conclusion like that. At least I hope so. But anyway, that's how I try to, that's how I see it. Good. Okay, you say lots but not everything. And you very convincingly argued that in the affirmative action case, or rather the, the race case, not an affirmative action case, and the campaign finance case, you were arguing for deference to democratic outcomes. I want to ask you about the third most controversial case this year, which doesn't fit into this pattern. That was the partial birth abortion case. And Justice Ginsburg wrote a wonderful dissent where she said there's just no empirical evidence for this claim that women who have these late-term abortions have an abortion trauma. It doesn't make any sense. Nevertheless, for someone who defends active liberty, as you do, and democratic deference, uh, why not uphold this law? This Most of the states passed it. Congress with bipartisan majorities passed it. 70% of Americans, Republicans and Democrats, support it. You could have construed it with a health exception, not to apply to the protected pre-viability abortions. Doesn't your general instinct to defer in the face of uncertainty lead you to uh, the opposite conclusion in this case? See, he's planned this whole interview just to get up to this question. <laughs> no, no, no. Cause, cause I'm he on wants your side, to, but he I want to he, wa he wants to get me talking about abortion, no, no, no. where I've been pretty careful not to talk outside the, the scope of my opinions. Really, I wrote a, an, an opinion, Nebraska versus Cathcart, which raised the same issue, and five to four uh, came to the conclusion that it was unconstitutional. And, and I, I can say a few things about it. I can say, if you look at Justice Ginsburg's dissent in this case, what I find very interesting about it is she's tried to bring in the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment as a question of women's what? Treating women equally. But women are not biologically the same. And so how do you keep people equally when the woman, but not the man, has this particular uh, 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 gives birth and has children. And that is a very deep, difficult question. But we come into that question, both Justice Ginsburg and I, come into that question with a history of case law. Roe versus Wade was decided 1973. I was appointed in 1994. Uh, that's quite a long time, period of time. And they decided Casey versus Polino. They decided other cases. So the only question for me, when you ask something like that, is am I going to overturn? Am I going to suddenly decide to overturn a whole lot of precedent? No. And there's a strong basis uh, that this was right as it started. And so uh, that's why uh, uh, I'm not going to go one whit further down this road. And I'm sorry I got into it in the first place. <laughs> a judicious answer, and thank you no. for it. There's one other uh, broad criticism that the uh, conservative critics of your vision raise, and that's that it's really just politics. You're saying judges should follow the election returns, they should be sensitive to the democratic visions of local uh, and national majorities, but the Constitution should be unchanging, it should mean only what the framers thought, uh, and therefore you're not paying proper attention to the rule of law. I know you've thought a lot about that uh, challenge, but what is your answer to it? It's, it's called not, a softball. Just, no, but it's, it's, not, it's not just, I mean, ju just as you said, I mean, the, the, the fact that I think that the democratic process is important at the heart of the Constitution does not mean I decide every case in favor of the law that comes up. That's why there are the limits. That's why you're at the boundaries. And now, obviously, sometimes I'm on one side of the boundary, and sometimes I think it's on the other side. I think certain things are unconstitutional. And I have written that certain things are unconstitutional. And now you come to, I'm trying to put it in a framework, you're trying to say, oh, well, what you do when you decide what's on one side of the boundary or the other is you just write your political opinions into law. What you happen to think is subjectively good. That's your question. And you want to know, is it answer? No. That's the answer. Now. What, what, I'll elaborate a little bit. I'll elaborate a little bit. Uh, 
because I often get people want to know, is it all politics? Is it just politics? And, and I, this is uh, how I've responded and I've thought about it. Politics, for even someone who was once on the Senate staff <laughs> and thus has some exposure to what it is to be an elected politician, though I doubt I'd ever achieve elected office. But look, politics, are you Democrat? Are you Republican? Who has the votes? And which particular senator or aspiring senator is popular? That's politics. Is he going to be elected? Is she going to be defeated? Are you a Democrat, Republican? I'd say at that level, I've not seen that in the Supreme Court of the United States. Now you say, well, what about Roe v. Uh, you know, what about Bush v. Gore? And we'll put that to the side, and I can discuss that a little bit later if you want. But, but I mean, I know you're skeptical about that. But, but I'll, I'll grant you over here skepticism. Save me that. Uh, I could perhaps make you a little less skeptical if I. But anyway, I haven't seen that, period. Now, there's another thing. You say, well, what about ideology? Are you really a, um, you know, are you an Adam Smith free enterpriser? Are you a um, Marxist, Maoist troublemaker? <laughs> uh, what are you anyway? What's your ideology? And I'll say, now, sometimes, you can see that creeping in, but it that kind of level of abstraction. No. If I catch myself saying, well, I'm just doing this because I think it's generally good or part of some kind of ideological picture, I think I've done the wrong thing. And I'll try to go back up and go down uh, the track a little bit more thoughtfully. Now, what about, well, who am I? I went to Lowell High School. I grew up in San Francisco. I grew up in the 1950s. I, like any other human being, has his own life experience. Uh, I've worked in law a long time. I, like other lawyers or other people who do have views about the relationship of, of law to life, of, of law to the individual, uh, of how it all works. But that's me. I can't escape that. And I don't think I should escape it. And you say, well, does that influence you? Yes. Yes, it does. But all that is translated into a highly complex reasoning or legal kind of process that and the process isn't a mask. It isn't just a joke. It isn't some kind of a fake, a good opinion. And maybe that's why there were 77 pages. I'm trying to write a good opinion. A good opinion of a judge can't prove that he's right in the manner of Euclid. She can't actually prove to you that the other side is wrong. But a good judge can put his or her reasons honestly down on that piece of paper. You put the reasons down, and others can criticize. And the key to it is they have to be the real reasons. Don't, and who knows if they are. Only, only, only the person knows, on, only the individual. But what fun or interest or value would there be in a job that you couldn't write down honestly how you get to that conclusion? I'm glad you mentioned your upbringing at Lowell High School and your formative experiences, because surely temperament matters. This little uh, book I just wrote said that it's crucial in determining success. You're one of the heroes of the book, because the broad thesis is that over time, the pragmatists, have been more effective, the people who can get along with their colleagues, compromise in the interest of the institution, whereas the ideologues, the law professors, the ones who are just trying to write treatises, have been less effective. I want to ask about how your experiences, especially uh, in the Senate, growing up in San Francisco, uh, dealing with bipartisan majorities, achieving practical problems and airline de deregulation, how that affected your pragmatic temperament. And if my thesis is right, then why aren't you in the majority more often? <laughs> A lot of things in what you say. First, the pragmatism. It's a special, it's not pragmatism in the sense that you're sitting there. Can I go into that for a second? Please do. Because I think a lot of the difference between, say, the approach I'll take or, say, someone like Justice Scalia, what does it come down to? And, and I think a way to, un to, to understand that 
is to think of a, of a judge there trying to interpret a text, and the text just, oh my God, it just, whether it's a statute or maybe it's a special part of the Constitution in a difficult circumstance, you have some words and there's a situation, and my goodness, it's unclear. Now, how does the judge attack that? I think all judges have six weapons that they will use to attack it. One, they read the text. Two, they look at the history of that text. Where did it come from? Who wrote it? What was there? Uh, all right. Three, tradition. What kind of tradition has grown up around the words? What is they, what have words like that have come to mean in the law? Uh, four, precedent. What does the precedent say? Five, the purpose or the value. What is the purpose of this statute? What are the values that underlie this particular provision? You see, the First Amendment expression, it's free speech values. Fourth Amendment, privacy values. And uh, First Amendment's not about privacy. Fourth Amendment isn't about speech. But they have different values that underlie it. Six consequences. Now, that's where you bring in cat pragmatism. But it's not consequences, any old consequence in the world. It's the consequence of deciding one way or another as related to, viewed through, evaluated in light of the purposes or the values that underlie that particular text. For example, if you're dealing with a speech case, probably the relevant consequences have to do with speech, not with privacy. So it's not old, any old consequence you're trying to figure out what's good or bad. You're trying to figure out in terms of that text. Now, every judge has those six weapons. Some judges, and here I, I tell you nothing, we did, Justice Scalia and I discussed this. I mean, uh, the, the, I think some judges, he will say, let's look at the first four. Text, history, tradition, precedent, and beware of those last two, purpose and consequence, because those last two will just allow the judge to substitute his own view for what the law was meant to be. Now, my view is, let's look at the last two. I don't say don't look at the first four. We do look at the first four. But often, in my opinion, the first four don't tell us the answer. So look at those last two and try to figure out what people are trying to do. And I say I try not to be subjective. I try to figure out what the people who wrote this text had in mind, what were their purposes, what were their values, and how will it work out. And I don't think there's more risk of subjectivity, though he thinks there is. But I do think, if I were to follow the other way, it would tend to cut the law loose from life. It would tend to cut that connection. But law is about life. Law is about how people in a group, communities, cities, states, nations, can live together. And they pass those rules to improve. That's the idea. There's no legislator I've ever seen who says, I'm passing this law because I want to make things worse. <laughs> Somebody has the idea that they're trying to improve some area of human life. So the judge cannot and should not cut that law loose from life. And then, when you get into the constitutional area, I think, my goodness, when they wrote that document, they had one purpose in mind above all others, and that we want a document that will live. We want a document that will live for several hundreds of years. And therefore, we insert values. Those values don't change. But the circumstances change. And so there, I probably will try to ask, and I think judges in this tradition, I'm not making myself special here, Judges in this tradition will tend to ask, how do we take those values that were there 200 years ago and before and long after and apply them to the circumstances of today? Now that's what I'm trying to do by way of pragmatism, and now I forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> <laughs> to return to the case with which we began, the school's case, yeah. are judges good at predicting the consequences of their decisions? In that case, you predicted first that there'd be lots of litigation, which must be right, because now the law is in flux, but you also said this might actually harm integration. And uh, I talked to a couple of scholars on both sides of the political spectrum who said, really, the court has a limited ability to harm or hurt society. Brown wasn't 
all that uh, responsible by itself for integration. It took the civil rights movement. And in this case, this is a small percentage of districts, maybe 5% that use these things to begin with. And if they really want the programs, they can resort to ruses. They can talk about socioeconomic disadvantages. But they can somehow keep doing it. And the rest of the districts aren't doing it anyway. So it's really not that big a deal. It depends on what consequences. I, I, I don't want to turn things on consequences that aren't fairly obvious. So what I'll do in an opinion like that is, in fact, they're, they're, it gets into rather arcane legal texts for those who aren't lawyers or tests. But one question that people wanted to ask to see whether this program was lawful was the question, is there a very strong interest in using race in this circumstance? It's called sometimes a compelling interest. So I said, yes, there is. That interest is in part remedial because we started with a history of segregation and we've never totally overcome that, never. And the need for remedy is still there. And it's in part educational. And that's because it's what what uh, Thurgood Marshall said years ago. He said, how can our children, how can, if, if our children can't learn together, our people will never learn to live together. And I think that's fairly safe as a prediction. I think that's a fairly reasonable point that most people would agree with. You see at the level I'm, I'm doing this? And then there's the civic interest. Better education, bring people together, civic reasons, educational reasons, remedial reasons. Put them together, I say that's compelling. If that isn't compelling, what is? And then there's a part where you go through, well, did they try to tailor this narrowly to meet the compelling interest? And I thought, yes, for reasons I'll not go into at the moment. It's very, it's detailed. But then I did go into what are the consequences of the other view. And there, I said, I don't see how it's not going to lead to a lot of litigation. And I don't think stirring up a lot of litigation in this race area is something that's likely to be constructive. And then, I, I rather limited in, I think, what I said. I said, there's a terrible problem. To see the problem, all you have to do is look at the numbers of what people describe as a kind of resegregation in the inner cities. And what you see is you see over time, uh, uh, after Brown and after the uh, uh, se uh, desegregation movement got well underway, a, a real decline in the number of schools and the percentage of schools that were one race schools. And now what you see more recently is a retrogression in that respect. And you don't have to really risk your reputation as a seer to say that there are problems of race and poverty that are mixed in the inner city. And so my only consequence, rele relevant consequence there was to say, I think that it is not helpful and that the Constitution doesn't foresee removing a weapon from those who might find it useful. I don't take a position as to whether that's the best way to solve the problems of race in the city. But I do take a position on what group of people the Constitution gives that decision-making authority to. And it isn't us, in my opinion. It is the local boards. So that was the way I was using consequences in that decision. Well, I would love to continue this part of the conversation, but as Jane Austen said, I think I've delighted you long enough, uh, and therefore, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask about unintended consequences. Returning to your earlier theme, sir, about judicial restraint versus what some see as an enthusiasm for overturning established doctrine. Do you see a possibility in the fullness of time that if the current majority trend takes hold, we might see a re-examination of such settled doctrines as giving corporations the rights but not the responsibilities of natural persons or counting political contributions as speech? See, interestingly enough, I can't answer the question because I don't know. 
and, and you think, well, I ought to know better than you. I, I work every day with the people who are involved. And it is true, I do work with them every day. But I actually don't know. And why don't I know? I don't know because a lot is a function of what cases come up. A lot is a function of nine different people trying to apply their own views, their own intelligence, their own thought, their own sensitivity to the particular matters that come up. And, and I, just as I think that, that the way my approach, which I've described, that doesn't really foretell how you'll decide individual cases. And similarly, I don't think Justice Scalia's approach really is going to tell him in advance how he's going to decide particular individual cases. You see, it's a, it's a very, a too, it's too difficult to answer, and we don't know. And that's why, was it either Yogi Berra? Who was it? Yogi Berra or Casey Stengel? I'm, I'm a sports illiterate. Yogi, Yogi Berra? Yeah. Yogi Berra's, uh, you know, I never make predictions, at least not, a, particularly not about the future. I mean, that's, that's the, <laughs> no, it's his joke. <laughs> it's much funnier, what? Yes. Yes, sir. Professor, excuse me, <coughs> Professor uh, Roger Crampton of Cornell Law School, no, uh, for all I know. I can't see you, Roger. Take my hat off. All right. I was saying that uh, Professor Roger Crampton of Cornell Law School, and for yeah. all I know other scholars, have made the case for the desirability of term limits on the Supreme Court. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, I, 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 I know what he's written. He, he thinks that they should have a very long term. And to be honest, whether you had a very long term or whether you had a, it's for life, I don't have a strong view. I mean, it might be better to have a very long term. I, I don't, I'm not against that. It was, Jefferson said, um, um, you know, the trouble with the Supreme Court is they, uh, uh, they never retire and they very rarely die. <laughs> but, but uh, if you had 18 years, I don't, I mean, you, what you want is you don't want someone on the court looking, what's my next job? I mean, absolutely not. And, and you do want the judges, uh, the, the federal judges, to be insulated. Uh, it's, you want them to be independent. I mean, the, the, the one thing we are supposed to do, and, and we do it, and it sometimes leads to decisions you don't like, nor that I don't like. But the one thing you do is not to try to make a decision, you don't make a decision in response to the opinion of the moment, in response to what the newspapers will say, in response to what somebody else will say. You make that decision on the ground you think it's the right decision. And that's what independence is there to safeguard. And of course people love it when the decision comes out their way, but that isn't the point. The point is that if you're the least popular person, in the United States, well, you're entitled to the same legal right as everybody else. And you don't want some judge in there who's worrying about his own career when he decides your case. And, and, and we don't have it perfectly. We don't, no, there's nothing perfect. But, but we've gone a long way in, in insulating federal judges, at least, from the kinds of pressures uh, that will uh, uh, lead to uh, something different than that a decision on the individual case. Yeah. Hi, thanks. You said that other than uh, Bush v. Gore that you didn't really see politics injecting itself into the court's decisions, and yet in um, Justice Ginsburg's dissent in the abortion case, which you were a part of, she said quite specifically that the only thing that had changed since the last time you decided that very issue, and I think it was seven years ago, I think 2000, was the politics of the justices on the court. And so I wonder if you could speak about that. And also I'm curious you, you know, what your thoughts are, certainly as someone who was in the mm -hmm. Senate, working in the Senate, um, about the confirmation process when you have senators hammering at justices about whether or not they're going to abide by precedent, mm -hmm. and two justices who come on the court and in one year summarily overturn arguably nine cases? Thanks. Um. A lot of things that you raise. One, what I said on Bush v. Gore, which I usually am fairly cautious about, but I'm not telling you things I haven't told other people, and I ought to put in a little caveat here. When I speak of an opinion I wrote, as I do sometimes, I'm not going beyond what I wrote. So, and moreover, uh, when I remember what I wrote, and if I have said something that isn't in the opinion, what I say doesn't count. <laughs> what counts is what's written. And little commentaries on that after 
No matter how hard they start, try to strike, keep to the opinion, may sometimes stray, and if they stray, they're wrong. All right. Now, Bush v. Gore, what I've said about that is, of course, that was a stressful and very difficult decision. It was a difficult period. All right, so uh, what I've said, I wrote a dissent. And so uh, I was appointed by President Clinton. And I'd met Vice President Gore. And people in the press would say my dissent could have favored that side. So how do I know I wasn't doing this on a political basis? And I can say on that is that what I tried to do in my own mind was to imagine the names were changed. And you imagine the names were changed, and everything else stays the same. And uh, would you come out the same way? So I did. And uh, I, that's, what I would, that's my own peculiar psychology, but that's what I was trying to do. And I, and I did. And I said, I know people can be self-kidders. And I know you're never certain. You can only do your best. Now, I said this at Stanford. And the AP ran a story saying Justice Breyer thinks he was wrong in Bush versus Gore. <laughs> you know, no, that wasn't my point. My point is I tried to be certain I wasn't deciding on the basis of the name of the person. And I did say, and I do think, my colleagues tried the same. They tried. And what you do as a member of that court is always, I always take, and we take each other's, good faith when we make decisions. And the court runs on that. And I've never been sorry that I assumed that a different judge was in good faith. Because basically, I think it's true. I think people do have different views. Now, you talk about nominating people. All right, you have to remember that I was the nominee. I was not the nominator. So asking the nominatee's views, it's, I say it's usually like asking uh, for a recipe for chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. <laughs> but but the, 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 the one thing that I think is important, uh, and, and I've learned this over time, is remember, I did grow up in the 40s and 50s. And uh, at that time, every Supreme Court justice had been appointed by Franklin Roosevelt or Harry Truman. So I thought that justices of the Supreme Court are supposed to be Democrats. But that's not what the Constitution provides. The Constitution quite wisely provides that with an advantage to a long tenure, to life tenure or a very long tenure, an advantage is that probably different presidents of different points of view will appoint different people. You say, well, does a president simply appoint somebody and then he knows he'll decide the right, all the right way from the president's point of view? No. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt appointed Oliver Wendell Holmes, and within a few months, Oliver Wendell Holmes had come out on the wrong side of the Northern Security case from President Roosevelt's point of view, and Teddy Roosevelt said, well, he said, I could appoint a judge with more backbone carved out of a banana. He was pretty annoyed. But I mean, that was the job. So you, you can't predict individual cases, and nor can you always predict general philosophies. But a judge, a president may try and you'd have to ask a president this, but may try to find someone who shares a kind of view at a very, very abstract conceptual level or very high level abstraction of relations of law to people or what law is like, etc. And at that kind of a level, maybe they'll have more luck. They won't always be right. And from the point of view of the chicken, what you do when you get there is you decide the cases. And that's it. And that's it. And now you want to find out all about the nominating process in the Senate. And I would say the nominating process in the Senate is something really the Constitution confines to the senators. And ultimately, they reflect the, the, uh, the, the public's general view. We have time for one more question. I've enjoyed your talk so far. I'm, I've been thinking about phrases like judicial restraint and activist judges and consequences as you think about how you interpret and make cases. Can you link some of that together for me, please? 
Say, say that again. The activists. The, this notion I of see. Yeah, the activists so versus consequences restraint. and then judicial restraint and how those things well, get. Well, the, 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 the consequences I've described, it's really, it's really sometimes in an opinion, I'll make an effort to, to say if I decide this way, what are the likely obvious consequences, the other way the same, and then say which is likely to be more consistent with the basic purpose or value underlying it. So that's at a slightly more technical level than your other question, other well, parts of your questions. Now, judicial restraint was the notion, judicial restraint activism. Activism is an insult. Somebody says you're an activist. That's supposed to be bad. Now, and, and judges don't like it. They don't want to be act. Nobody thinks he's an activist. Sometimes some judge may say I'm an activist, but if he says that, he means it in quotes as a kind of ironic comment. Where did it come from? I once had to give a talk. I looked it up. I'll give you a two-minute answer. When I looked it up, I discovered the term came from Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., in an uh, article he wrote in Look Magazine in 1948, where he was trying to describe the difference on the Supreme Court of that time between Black and Douglas on the one hand and Frankfurter and Jackson on the other. And that court, which was the Roosevelt Court, later the Truman Court, but they had been appointed at a time when the country really rebelled against the obstacles that the pre-New Deal court had thrown in the way of social legislation. And they wanted judges who would read the Constitution in a manner that permitted the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, it was the Commerce Clause that was the big problem then, but, 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 but in a manner that would, and Roosevelt thought this was right, the judges then thought it was right, give the legislatures an opportunity to enact social legislation that they believed was necessary. All right, so what was Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s historical origin of the word activist. He said these two views are the following. What Black and Douglas believe is, I think Thayer or somebody at Yale may have said this, he said, he who is least favored in life should be most favored in law. Now that's a noble sentiment. I mean, there's something to that. You can understand why people might think that. But Frankfurter said, that is terrible. Don't do it. Because if you go down that road, your decisions will last precisely your lifetime, and somewhat less. Because that isn't a neutral way of deciding things. And you're criticizing the old court for favoring the rich, so you come along, you favor the poor, so somebody else will come along and they'll favor somebody else, and it just doesn't work. You have to have a consistent attitude. And that's where judicial restraint comes in. Judicial restraint comes in because people say that was the Frankfurter consistent attitude. Read the Constitution, and particularly in the economic and social area of giving the legislature very broad authority to enact what they believe their constituents want enacted. That's the origin of the phrase. Now, when else it has been used? It was used during the Warren Court by people who said judges shouldn't be managing school systems. Judges, oh, by the way, in terms of that first thing, probably everybody on the present court is pretty much judicial restraint. Okay. Now, uh, Warren period. Uh, judges shouldn't be managing school systems. Judges shouldn't be managing mental hospitals. Judges shouldn't be uh, managing prisons. Their job is deciding cases. We look around and judges are doing all of the above. That's activist. So when I spoke about this and I, I, I talked to a Chicago, uh, a group of Chicago law students, I got some pictures because I wanted to explain why that had happened. And I showed them a picture of a school in the South before desegregation. And I said, I'd like you to look at that. There's a shack, obviously. And then here's the white school over here. And now I'd like you to see what happened after 1954. And I've had a few pictures there of the Ku Klux Klan and uh, uh, what was going on. And I said, now put yourself in the position of the courts in the Warren period. They had said the Constitution means what it says. But nobody was doing anything. Congress didn't help out. The state legislatures didn't help out. The school districts were massively disobedient. So the courts had the choice 
of trying to do what they could or saying, forget about it. Well, that isn't a really tough choice. It's not a tough choice. It's a rather easy choice. And so now you can perhaps understand why they did their best, not always perfectly, but why they did their best in that period. Now I'd like to show you a picture of the mental hospital that they took over, and I actually found one in Life magazine from the 50s. And my goodness, say, look at that. And now consider these words, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law. And look at that. And nobody's doing anything about it. All right? So can you understand it? And I read them the description of one of those prisons. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And now read the words in the Constitution. So we can understand it, can't we? We can understand it. Now, maybe it didn't always work perfectly. And maybe on some theory, judges shouldn't be doing that. But nobody else was. And they do have the Constitution. And they do have the situation. And so I say I can understand that. But since that time, luckily, Congress has stepped in. And states have stepped in. And there have been lots and lots and lots and lots of water that has flowed over the, under that bridge. And, and we don't have that problem to the same degree anyway now. So I don't think anyone is worried about activism in that sense of activism. And then you have what you said. That's activism. I mean, activism in the sense of how willing are you to strike down laws passed by the legislature. And I guess you say, which I think I feel is true, is that Ruth and, and I have been among the ones less likely to do it. So on that measure, we're not very activist. And uh, uh, there we are. Okay, that's the best I can do on your question.